thank you very much to, to Frank and to Aware for the invitation to, to speak here tonight. Um, uh, as, as some of you know, I, I wrote this book, The Call the U-Turn. Uh, it actually was written a number of years ago, and I, and I updated it relatively recently prior to publication. And uh, I, I generally, when I talk to, to in, in, in public, I often talk about the subject of alcohol and addiction and moods and so on. So actually, this is a novelty for me to actually uh, look at the, uh, the, the, the other side of, of my work, which is uh, really exploring, uh, understanding human emotion, uh, negative emotions, how they affect us, and trying to find a way through uh, negative experiences, negative emotions, to try and, and make a journey to happiness. When I wrote the book, uh, and I called it the U-turn, I thought the U in U-turn referred to you, as in your journey, your, your movement, uh, your U-turn. And after a while, I, I realized that the U really didn't refer to you, it really referred to understanding, and that what uh, this whole journey was about, was about uh, the U was for self-understanding. And then after I thought about it a little bit longer, um, I realized that the U in U-turn refers to the unconscious, that actually one of the most powerful forces in our lives is our unconscious, and that an awful lot of the, the journey that we have to do in our emotional development, and, uh, and as Frank referred to, our uh, recovery really has to do with appreciating the unconscious uh, and appreciating the complexity that it brings to our lives. So if that isn't confusing enough, I think I'll start off and talk a little bit about what it's about. Um, there's, there's five stages um, in, in this book and five stages that I, that, I, that I like to talk about. First of all, I look at why you need this book, what, 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 it, what it has and what it brings to you. Then I look at the whole concept of negative emotions under, under different headings um, because negative emotions are really uh, a major pointers for us uh, about what is going on uh, in our lives. Um, I deal with them under different headings. Psychiatrists love to categorize things in lovely, neat categories like depression and anxiety and phobias and so on and so forth. But mostly when going through uh, an emotional experience, we really are just conscious that we're tremendously unhappy and we want to get out of it. So that while we latch on to the categories that are given to us, uh, that's not our individual experience when going through it. It really is, how can I become happy because I'm damned unhappy now? Um, when I look at each of a, a number of headings of these negative emotions, I then look at probably the core of the book and the, the bottom of the U and the U-turn, which is looking at the fundamentals of self-belief. Uh, because I firmly believe that one of the core determinants in how happy we become in life and how, how we deal with life and uh, how we deal with our unhappiness is fundamentally what we think of ourselves and uh, the issues that lead to, to self-esteem. Um, I then will be talking reasonably briefly about the importance of relationships uh, because that in itself is not uh, an hour's topic. That in itself is uh, a day, a week, a month, a year. Um, it's, it's just way too much to, to, to talk about in, in, a, in a brief period. So what I do is I talk about a few fundamental principles about what I believe uh, drives uh, relationships and some added insight which may be helpful and then I move on because it's such a complex issue. And finally, I dare to talk about the reason for it all um, and how we find a joy and fulfillment in life and ways uh, that, that you can seek joy and fulfillment. I do not pretend to have the answer. So if you think I have the guru's answer to it all, I simply don't. But I have a few suggestions about ways that may be helpful in terms of, of making that journey, making that, 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 seek, uh, that, uh, that looking for, for joy and fulfillment. Um, but please, I don't have all the answers. So, self-understanding, what about it? Okay. Um, when we make a journey through trauma, through stress and distress and upset, there has to be a purpose to that journey. It is not enough for us to go through that journey and say, great, it's done, I'm over that now, and I'm never going through that again. The only purpose in going through an episode of upset or anxiety or trauma is to learn about ourselves so that we don't have to go through it again. At our core, um, we, we, we have a, an instinct. Um, and the instinct really has to do with learning about emotions. 
Um, emotions are the communication to our core. Um, and when we go through negative emotions, it's a, it's, a, it's a pointer that something is at wrong, something is, at, is, 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 is maladjusted in our core. And emotions allow us, give us pointers to communicate with what's going wrong down, down below. In, in anatomy, in brain structure, there is a, a, an, a, an area of the brain called the limbic system. And the limbic system is where our emotions reside. Um, the, 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 the limbic system um, is, um, I can list off the anatomical parts, but it, it lies between the cortex, where our higher thinking exists, and what's below that is what's called the basal ganglia, which controls our movements and our actions. So um, what happens with our limbic system which we all have, is that that is where our core emotional activity resides. All animals have an limbic system. All animals may or may not have a, a cortex, and they certainly have a, a movement, so, uh, or a, an area that controls movement. So when I talk about, throughout the book, about the importance of feeling, thinking, and then acting, it kind of mirrors the three fundamental areas of the brain structure that is not just unique to humans but to, 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 to all animals, which is that there is a, a feeling area, which is this limbic system, there is a thinking area, which is our cortex, and there is an acting area, which is both below and above, because the, 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 uh, the areas that control our movements and our actions actually is right across the brain. So the journey that I talk about in the U-turn often is... Use, you use feelings to explore, to gain a thing. There is something wrong. I, I need to explore these feelings. You think about them because there is no point in having a feeling and uh, not, not thinking about it. And then you act to balance out those feelings. You act to Im Im improve the, the, those patterns of thinking and you act to prevent yourself going through those, those feelings again. Okay. Everything is unfortunately and fortunately individual. Um, there is no commonality to a journey of self-discovery. There are perhaps some common traits or some common emotions, but nobody can tell you what that journey consists of. It has to be your individual journey. Um, it is helpful to, to learn from others. It is helpful to read, to, to, to talk to people, and to learn how they have made their own individual journey through their own self-understanding. But essentially, this is a journey that has to be done alone, with help, with guides, but it is an individual journey. So, let's talk about some of the negative emotions that we have to deal with. One negative emotion that we all have to deal with at certain times is anger. And the interesting thing about anger is that the most common cause of anger is not irritability or somebody else, but the most common cause of anger is hurt. Hurt is the fundamental drive that drives most experiences of anger. Um, and anger can be useful. Anger can be useful if it liberates us from the hurt that drives it. So if anger allows us to get rid of hurt and get us into an emotional balance, then anger is useful. When anger is not useful, it's when it's repetitious. If we lose our temper, if we, we, we indulge anger constantly, well then if it's repeated constantly, then anger is not balancing, it's indulgent. And the problem about anger is that just at the point that we lose temper, that we, we indulge in anger, there's a willfulness, there's a choice in it. At a certain point, anger is a choice, not an inevitability. And it needs to be exercised. That concept of choice, I will indulge my anger, I will restrain myself, I will shout at you, I will not shout at you. I will do it again versus I will not do it this time. That choice, first of all, there has to be an awareness of it. And secondly, that choice has to be exercised. 
in order for anger to be controlled. There's a story about Adolf Hitler, who was unfortunately a, a master of, of self-control. And at one stage in, in the, the mid-1930s, he was uh, having a, a dinner party in, I think it's Berchtesgarten, is where his place was in the, the Alps. And in the middle of this uh, dinner party, there was a, a visitor announced, and it was a British diplomat who had come along to discuss some crisis in the ongoing negotiations prior to the Second World War. And so uh, Hitler ordered his, uh, his uh, assistant to show uh, this diplomat into the, the room next door. And right in front of his guests, he started pacing up and down. And he started pacing up and down, and he started visibly getting angry. He began to gesticulate. He flushed and went red. And at the end of 10 or 15 minutes, he worked himself up into a state of complete anger. He then went in to the room next door, and he shouted and screamed, and he made his point extremely angrily to this visiting British diplomat. And the British diplomat was sent out of the room after a brief while and went back to London to convey Hitler's extreme <coughs> displeasure and extreme uh, concern and, and, and the intensity of, of his feelings about whatever the particular point was. Hitler then moved out of that room, moved back to his dinner party, and spent five minutes calming himself down, bringing himself down, controlling his anger, and then saying, great, and then joining back in on the, on the dinner party. So that's an extreme, but anger is an indulgence, and it can, be, it can be a choice, and it can be fostered, and it can be controlled. So... If you're in a position where you suffer and you lose your temper and you're frequently anger, you actually have to acknowledge it and then aim to control it. And by and large, the most effective technique about controlling anger is, in a moment of quietness, is switch yourself and turn yourself over to what is the position of the person that you're being angry towards. So that get out of your own mentality, switch it around, and look at it from the position of the person who you're talking to or, or who you're losing your temper with. And by and large, anger is expressed and generally conveyed to someone close to you and often the same person constantly. So one of the best ways of controlling anger is understanding it, but the best way is put yourself in the position of the other person and learn from that. Second point I'm going to talk about, second negative emotion I'm going to discuss is jealousy. And the reason I'm going to talk about it is because it does pervade uh, our lives to a certain extent. We live in a hierarchical world. Um, there are status given to, to various people. It is a social status. It is a, uh, a financial status. It can be uh, uh, any sort of a, uh, a status. But, but, but we still are fundamental animals. And animals, if you look at other mammals' behaviors, we see they're very sociable. And social hierarchy is crucial to the way that we interact with the world. We all may be equal in the sights of God, but certainly not in the, in the sight of humans. Um, we often do things to try and prove our superiority. Um, and, of course, the areas we try to prove our superiority are the areas that we feel most inferior in. And jealousy, by and large, is, is envy gone wild. It's where it can be a dominant factor. It is often uh, focused on individuals, not on things. And it, become a, it can become a dominant factor in our lives. Um, Joseph Stalin was the most powerful person in the Eastern world for about 20, 25 years. He grew up in the countryside in Georgia, in, in, uh, in, in uh, southern Russia, and he was an uneducated, rough country, country lad. Um, he spent his entire life working his way to the, the pinnacle of, of the power structure in, in, in Russia, and he remained insecure and almost paranoid for his entire life, uh, despite being at the top of, of the social structure. 
he described himself uh, to Khrushchev, his successor, as being utterly alone. He felt he could trust no one. And he felt as if he wasn't in charge, despite him having 180 million people and also having killed a considerable amount of them. Uh, he still felt he was not in charge of his life in any, in any shape. And that stemmed the reason, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but the, one of the reasons he felt jealous of people, envious, was because of his personal insecurity. If that is dominating someone's emotional life, and for some people it can be a very dominating factor, by and large, the trick is again to look at it from the other person's point of view. Um, the second way and the second uh, method of getting rid of jealousy and envy really comes down to talking it out. Okay? With a therapist, with a friend, with a counselor, but talking out feelings of uh, intense uh, jealousy or envy are wonderful ways of, of putting them to one side. The next thing I want to talk about is depression. And depression is a word which is very commonly used. It is a, a catch-all phrase which describes a whole cluster of emotions. Um, but by and large, depression is a horrible experience, and you can learn for it. I'd like to quote a description by Brian Keenan, who was a hostage in the Lebanon um, many, many years ago. And he, and he wrote a book called An Evil Cradling. And this is he described being a hostage. A hostage is crucifying aloneness. It is a silent, screaming slide into the bowels of ultimate despair. A hostage is a man hanging by his fingernails over the edge of chaos and feeling his fingers slowly straightening. A hostage is the humiliating stripping away of every sense and fiber of mind and spirit that makes you what you are. A hostage is a mutant creation full of self-loathing, guilt, and death-wishing. But he's a man, a rare and unique and beautiful creation of which these things are no part. I've never heard a better description of what depression feels like than that description. Uh, there's plenty of descriptions in psychiatric textbooks of you know, the, the clusters of symptoms, but that for me is, is, is a, a very vivid description of the emotional experience of depression. Um, that individual experience of depression is extremely individual. No two people feel the same when they're going through an episode of depression. Uh, for example, depression can focus on one item, um, the, uh, the mind can be very deceptive. It can choose the wrong item to be depressed about. I can recall many years ago, one man coming in to, to, to hospital, and he was very depressed about his neighbor purchasing a, a slice of land on the, on the land beside him, and that he'd given up his land. And of course, being Irish, we all can relate to the idea about land being crucial. Um, but for the entire time that he was in hospital, his, his, his focus was on this land and his mistake in selling the land to his neighbor. And it was when his depression lifted through varieties of, of treatment, he began to see that actually the land was not the issue at all. It was his depression that was, was the issue. So depression, as part of the mental journey, can focus on an issue that may not actually be the, 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 the core issue at all. Um, depression can uh, hide another problem. Uh, depression can hide other problems such as alcohol or marital troubles. Um, but after going through a bout of depression, there is one thing worth asking. Um, what do I have to learn from this bout of depression? What do I have to learn from this journey? Um, and at the end of a period of exploration, there may be a conclusion. Actually, there's not that much to be learned. Actually, I am reasonably balanced. I, I have achieved a certain amount, and that th this depression is just out of the blue and doesn't really lay down. That's okay. But by and large, there is something to be learned from a depression. It may not be best to learn it in the middle of a depression, but by and large, a depression can be educational, and it is worth spending some time, if going through a period of depression, afterwards to figure out what were the negative factors that may have contributed to it. There is a, a great debate in, in psychiatry that you'll have heard about, is this depression chemical or reactive? And um, there is no straightforward answer to that. Uh, most depressions have both chemical and reactive components, a psychological and a, and a biological. We are all biological entities. We are all full of neurochemicals. 
So um, when a, an experience such as depression, of course there's a chemical component to this because the neurochemicals, the neurotransmitters in our brains are moderately imbalanced during a period of depression. There is no depression that does not have a psychological component. Um, when going through depression, it is, is possible, as I described, about focusing on an item uh, and uh, whether or not it is the fundamental item. But all depressions, about the psychological and a biological, have a reactive and a chemical component. And more practically, when it comes to treatment, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, is that um, it's not possible to predict from uh, natural saying, oh, well, that's clearly reactive. It is not possible to predict what will be the method of treatment that is most effective based upon this evaluation about it, whether predominantly chemical or predominantly uh, psychological. So that point, all depressions have both a psychological and a chemical component. Depression the experience, and depression, the escape. Okay? There are many ways of helping depression. The worst thing is to do nothing. Okay? Never get into depression and say, that's it. There is always something that can be done, um, always is something. And one of the important things about a depression is learning about perspective. I mentioned that depressions can get focused on a single item. Um, but reality does not exist. It is just a perspective. Um, just by the by, there, there, there was um, in, in the alcohol uh, treatment program, there is a component of the, the, uh, the, uh, the program called reality, which um, has now been re rephrased. Um, but it has to do with uh, someone with an addiction problem going through their, their previous experiences and looking at their own experiences with alcohol and owning up to them. Um, but it was called, for many years, this, this, this uh, part of the program was called reality. And then uh, on one occasion, um, uh, there was a little notice on the door uh, where the, the, the counselor was not available, and it said, reality has been postponed. Um, and I thought it was kind of a nice, uh, a nice idea. It would be, it would be nice to re reality. Well, the point I'm saying is that, is that it's not quite that we can postpone re reality, but reality is how we see it, not how it actually is. If you take uh, someone with, I'm, I'm sure many of you have experienced uh, people with a handicap with Down syndrome. And uh, I worked with the, the handicapped uh, as part of my training. And I remember dealing with a, a large number of people with, with Down syndrome. And not universally, but almost universally, they have a wonderful perspective in life. By and large, they're positive. By and large, they interact very positively. Their, their interactions, with, certainly with me and, and with, with my colleagues, was you know, very uh, enjoyable. And um, it's very easy for, 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 for us to say, oh, gosh, uh, their reality must be a negative one because they're dealing with some degree of handicap. You know, they need to be supported and looked after. Um, but, of course, their perspective is entirely different. Uh, they, they, they often are blessed with a, with a positive outlook. And so... If they can maintain a, a positive and a, a view on reality, well, uh, why shouldn't we, uh, who may not uh, have uh, may have our own difficulties, but but may not have that degree of, of 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 handicap? So, for every negative attitude, there is an equal and opposite positive attitude. So, every every negative reality is balanced with a positive one. It is all a matter of perspective. And sometimes we can learn from about a depression, we can change what we have to, uh, and we can liberate ourselves. There's various methods of getting out of a period of depression. I put it down a number of different headings. Okay. Talking it through, okay. the use of therapy. I'm not so much an advocate of this particular therapy versus that particular therapy, but certainly my experience is that talking it out particularly the help of therapists, can be a wonderful, liberating journey through depression. Medication. Medication is often used to help people going through a period of depression. And by and large, may not be the first medication at the first dose, may involve changes or combinations. By and large, antidepressant or, or mood-altering medication can be wonderfully effective and, excuse me, break the back 
of a depression when other interventions do not. Exercise. Research is showing more and more that exercise is remarkably helpful. The, the type of exercise that appears to be most helpful is cardiovascular exercise and lots of it. Okay, so not necessarily bodybuilding exercise that, that, that makes you turn into Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, but cardiovascular exercise. The research that I've, I've shown us is about 45, 60 minutes, two, three times a week of good, robust cardiovascular exercise can help someone through a mild and moderate depression. Probably not a severe depression, but a mild to moderate depression. Deep relaxation. Methods including meditation, mindfulness, uh, yoga, tai chi, uh, even sitting, listening to um, uh, chanting music, any way that gets you into deep relaxation. Uh, massage therapy, acupuncture, all are different variations of the theme of getting into a deeply relaxed state. And what I call self-mastery, the idea of self-exploration, learning exploring your feelings, thinking it through, and then acting to combat those, those negative uh, feelings or those, uh, th- those thoughts. Um, the idea of that using a depression as a, as a way of exploration, personally or, or with the, the, the help of a therapist, are wonderful ways with dealing with depression. The next experience I want to talk about, or look at, is anxiety. Fear and anxiety. We do not have to lead our lives crippled with fear. There are many ways to defeat it. Uh, Anxiety is universal. There is not one person that uh, uh, has gone through uh, any sort of existence without without having had an experience of anxiety. And uh, I, I can't really explain to you what the origin of anxiety or fear is. Stephen King, the author, in a preface to one of his horror novels, and let's face it, seeing as he spent his lifetime trying to create anxiety, he should at least have some insight into its causes. He believes that, 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 uh, that anxiety is really a fear of death because no other anxiety can be that fundamentally deep and profound. And I said, fair enough, maybe there's something to that. Because, again, when you've gone through a period of anxiety and you look back on it, by and large, the degree of our response to the item we're anxious about is greater than the, than the item. You know? So, so the, the anxiety is greater than, uh, than, than the item we're afraid of. So where is the fundamental origin? I can't tell you if Stephen King is right, but it's an interesting perspective. And... Um, when I overcome my own fear of death, I will let you know. <laughs> um, so that's a journey. That's a work in progress. Um, and often we're anxious about the wrong things. Uh, we may uh, find ourselves uh, focused on uh, an item and we're, we're particularly anxious about it. And indeed, uh, the, the, there's a little perverse part of me that says, gosh, one way to make sure something doesn't happen is to worry about it. Uh, because by and large, the things that I'm anxious about are not the things that go wrong, and the things that go wrong, I just just never perceive that they're going to go wrong. Um, so I, if, 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 I, if, if, if we, we have this great uh, interaction with karma, and we, that's one way of dealing with it. Focus on it, and it won't go wrong. But um, we can uh, focus inappropriately on certain items, get overly anxious about it, and of course, they're the things that, that never cause the problem. Anxiety can be useful. For those of us who've done exams, which is just about everybody, anxiety gets you working. Uh, For those of us that have work and deadlines, anxiety is useful. If we're indifferent, we don't get anxious, we don't get, we don't uh, achieve and work at it. So there's a useful level of background anxiety. But clearly, when anxiety becomes dominant in life, well then, clearly it becomes a massively negative factor. Um, Psychiatrists talk about uh, different types of anxiety, and a lot of you will be familiar with headings of generalized anxiety, which describes an anxiety which is pervasive, constant, um, and dominating almost all parts of the day. There's a panic, which is an anxiety that becomes overwhelming in bursts, 
that often has physical accompaniments, but generally is, is horrible, but relatively short-lasting. Uh, there is specific phobias, which focus on specific items, uh, lifts, spiders, heights, uh, and that the anxiety only occurs in this situation of threat. Um, and there's obsessional anxiety with repetitive thoughts or repetitive behaviors, which uh, uh, are indulged in as a way of coping with anxiety. No matter what type of anxiety, there's ways of dealing with it. And because anxiety is very fearful, one of the best ways to deal with it is relaxing, is fighting anxiety, is using anxiety-relieving techniques. What anxiety-relieving techniques are there? There's many anxiety-relieving techniques. There's muscle-relaxing exercises. There's deep breathing exercises. There's, um, uh, uh, God, there's meditation. There's mindfulness. There's a wide variety of relaxation techniques. And they are often, when practiced frequently enough, wonderful ways of, of, of diminishing the intensity of anxiety. By and large, of course, what most people are guilty of is doing it when they feel anxious and not bothering when the anxiety is relieved. So the most effective way of relaxation is constant, moderate relaxation. And of course, most people don't bother with it until anxiety is overwhelming. Um, so deep relaxation and constantly. Um, uh, the, the getting advice about management of anxiety. Uh, medication, there's lots of anti-anxiety medications uh, which can be very effective. If there's a stressful situation and we can avoid it, that's okay. And I'm sure every cognitive therapist in the room uh, or in the room will say, that's dreadful, how can you avoid it? Don't avoid it, you know, face it, face it. And I say, yep, but if, you know, if, if sometimes the best way to deal with an anxiety is not pick at the scab, is not stab the knife in the arm constantly. It's saying, right, if there's a situation that I can happily avoid that causes me enormous stress, why don't I simply avoid it? Um, uh, exercise, uh, I've gone through in describing for, for, for depression. Exercise can be a wonderful way for management of constant anxiety. And again, going back to the same principles about feeling, thinking, and acting, exploring the emotions that we feel, exploring the thoughts that are underneath it, and then acting against them is a wonderful way of coping with long-term anxiety. Criticism. Well, I'm not going there. You guys might criticize me, and I might end up hating you, and I'm too sensitive, so it's not going to work out, so uh, please don't criticize me. So the point I want to make about criticism is, is that really, if you feel that you must criticize someone, don't. Uh, if it's all possible, never criticize. Why? Because criticism is a self-indulgence. Uh, it's uh, the imposition of your opinion above someone else's opinion that unless it causes massive, massive distress, don't criticize because there is another perspective. And uh, if it's vital to change someone's behavior, perhaps you're in a work situation and, and uh, the, the, someone's work is dysfunctional, uh, by and large you praise, you praise, you praise, you correct for two seconds and then you praise again. So criticism can be uh, uh, a, a way of really causing an awful lot of uh, hurt and pain to someone else. And anybody who, who has gone through a period of being criticism is that the reason I pair it with the word hatred is that you criticize, you get hated. So, so please balance it uh, if, if, if it must be done. Self-belief and inferiority. One of the fundamentals and one of the cores of the, of the book that I talk about is really the importance of self-belief. What we think of ourselves underlies everything we think and do. Um, uh, that the experiences often developed when we're in uh, childhood or in our teenage years often have a massive influence 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. Um, uh, people will avoid uh, pain uh, or painful situations uh, that they learned when they were younger and spend a lifetime doing it. It, it can have a massive, massive influence and what we think of ourselves, not what others think, but what we think of ourselves is, is fundamental. And it often pervades causes of anxiety, depression, negative emotions. And really, I can't, I can't emphasize it enough. Our self-belief, our belief in ourselves, 
uh, and more particularly when it's not good, has a massive influence on all the negative emotions that I've described. How do we develop our self-belief? Well, um, it, by and large, there's internal factors and external factors. The internal factors are very early experiences, childhood experiences, and our parents. Okay, we absorb an enormous amount of our, our self-belief from our parents and our relationship and our interactions with our parents. The external factors, interactions with our peers and in the teenage years, and then what we do in terms of what we achieve or what we aim to do and, and how uh, successful we are, external factors, but I would say much, much secondary to the fundamental uh, internal factors that, that are related to early childhood experience. Uh, we all know Madonna. Madonna is the, probably the, one of the most famous pop stars in the world. And she is a, a famously brash and uh, aggressive personality. Uh, her mother died when she was six. And she would relate all her changes, everything she did in her life, to her mother dying when she was, when she was six. Uh, she was uh, able to describe, you know, 40, 50 years later, the details of, of that occasion uh, to, to an to, to a extraordinary detail. And it's not surprising um, uh, when you think about it, about how massively disruptive uh, such a horrible experience can be. Um, and so the, the essence of our, our self-image is often created at an early age, and unfortunately, the negative aspects of it can have a massive influence. We can perpetuate our self-image uh, by wallowing in it, okay? Because sometimes our negative self-image, uh, we perpetuate it. Uh, we get, I won't say comfortable with it, but we indulge it, we uh, express it, we, um, uh, and w we focus on it, and we recurrently think about it, and, of course, we, we look inward. So one of the uh, issues about self-consciousness is, is that it's actually a very selfish thing. So... Obviously, one of the ways of dealing with self-consciousness, and self-consciousness can be a massively negative experience, is to change the focus from inward to outward. Um, I remember the story about, uh, at, a, at a, a conference recently uh, about a 32-year-old man who founded a uh, charity called Water. And he, it is now one of the most successful charities in the world. It, uh, it, it organizes well digging in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, it has now, I think, uh, helped provide water, fresh water, for something like 3 million people in sub-Saharan Africa. Their initial aim is, is 20 million, and then they aim to, to provide fresh water for, for 100 million people. Um, but the person who founded, whose name escapes me, um, was uh, a, uh, uh, an alcoholic and a drug abuser for... 12 years of his life. He uh, was a nightclubber um, and he was uh, sponsored by various drink companies. Uh, he's a good looking male model and he spent 10 years uh, drinking and drugging his way around the nightclubs of Manhattan and, and various places around the world. Um, and that he recalls that when he went after a trip to South America, in which he had uh, something like a 12 day binge of, of, of drugs and alcohol. Uh, all sponsored. He came back to, to his home in New York and woke up one morning and said, this, this has to stop. I cannot deal with this. Um, I detest what I do. I detest my life. And I, a very negative self-image. And he decided he was going to change. And the way he changed was that he decided to look at what there was a great need in the world. He uh, uh, saw a documentary about sub-Saharan Africa and the vitalness of, of, of uh, fresh water and he founded a charity which has transformed the lives of millions of people. So when we have a negative self-image, it is important to be aware that there are causes of it and that can be changed. I'd like to, I'd like to, to read another section which is on the, on the core of self-belief, which is the idea of fighting back. Somewhere down in the pits of self-degradation is a little flame. It is small. It looks as though it can easily be extinguished and it doesn't burn very brightly. But it is there. Uh, what it is, I cannot really say, but is that certain something that allows us to fight back 
when we have nothing to fight back with. It is that something that enables us to hope that the next day will be better, even if the, next, if the day gone by was pure torture. It is present at different levels and at different amounts in different people. Some people have to hit rock bottom before they realize they have it. Some people have to escape from whatever internal pressure is on them before they feel it inside them. But we all have it, and that is exactly what we must use to fight back against all that, op- that oppresses us, even if that oppression is self-inflicted. So that's what I talk about, about the, the fundamental of that self-image, if it's negative, is the appreciation that we can have influence over it and that we can fight back against it, even if it is self-created and self-perpetuated. One of the ways of fighting back is we learn to say the most important word in the English language. Some of you who, are, who, who uh, know me know what that word is. Any guesses what that word is? No. That is the most important word in the English language because it is crucial that we exercise the ability to say no as a statement of self-existence. And so you should... I don't say you stand in the mirror every evening saying no to the mirror, but that is a crucial way to, to fight back. And, and exercising that God-given right to exist, that God-given right to self-determination and self-existence and, and a positive self-image, you start off often by saying no. It may be so, no to a person, it may be no to a situation, it may be no to a habit, but saying no... And, and everything stems from that. Uh, decisions that we take, um, behaviors stem from internal decisions. And so the idea of, of, of making that is a statement, it doesn't have to be to anybody else. It's an internal statement. No, and then finding a way to act in accordance with that is, is a vital way to, to, to defeat a negative self-image and start the U-turn and journey back. How do you master your self-image once you have this awareness of, of the importance of, of fighting back? Um, well, one way is to explore the, the images, uh, the, the self-image in different areas of life, um, the, the, the four fundamental areas of life, work, relationships, social life, and spiritual life. And then looking at those headings under, under uh, the, the idea of where am I at in each of those areas, where would I like to be at in each of those areas, and how am I going to get there? Because if self-esteem is created at a fundamental area in life, it is perpetuated by what goes on around us now, and exercising the, the, the right to, to determine that, that existence is, is, uh, is fundamental. And next I want to talk a little bit about personality and personality structure, and the importance, I call it personality and projection, or the importance of of presentation. Um, Our public persona is made up of our appearance, our manners in speech, um, and we can often adjust our patterns of speech, our mannerisms, by following examples of those people that we admire or think have a good good, uh, manner. And by an effort at projection, we like to project, we like to influence what people think of us. Um, Our self-image is largely determined by the interaction between those external things that we convey and our inner core, what we fundamentally think about ourselves. And the way that we clarify and adjust and make real our self-image, is we have certain defense mechanisms. And defense mechanisms were described by Freud 100 years ago, and they're the pattern of our own particular use of interactions. They're a pattern that we develop, and it really is our personality. Our personality is just a pattern of behavior, a pattern of interaction with our, with our own emotions, and these are one way of describing those patterns. The, 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 the words are but denial, repression, projection, sublimation. I'll just take one. Um, and the, probably the most positive defense mechanism is sublimation. And sublimation means the idea of taking a negative upset and turning it into something positive. So it's not used in a negative way. 
Um, uh, the, the idea that someone who suffered a trauma or an emotional upset turns around and says, I want to become a counselor or a therapist, and then goes off and qualified and uses the, 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 the emotional distress and the pain that they've suffered for the good of others. Um, the idea of projection is, I'll just describe another, the, the, the idea of projection is the idea of a defense mechanism where an upset is projected onto someone else, uh, saying that, um, uh, that you are the person who is angry, not me. Uh, you are the person who is hateful, not me. Whereas, in fact, it really is the, uh, an internal process. So the defense mechanisms, we all have defense mechanisms. We all use them all the time. So recognition of our particular pattern of defense mechanisms is a wonderful way of recognizing our particular personality structure or personality characteristics. What they reflect really is our inner core being. Uh, our fundamental uh, desires, our fundamental uh, uh, aims and, and ambitions, and our personality is, in fact, defending ourselves from that core ideas or core uh, uh, characteristics. So, if you want to understand your personality makeup, explore it. Look at how you appear or how you project to others, list them off. Um, describe defense mechanisms that you use, ways of avoidance of emotion, ways of avoiding of truth that you use in uh, interacting with others, and then use that to explore, well, this is my core. This is my core pattern of dealing with people. These are my core emotions. Personality is extremely individual. Nobody has the same balance and of components that uh, everybody else has. I want to talk a little bit about talking. Um, and the reason I want to talk a little bit about talking is the idea that communication between ourselves is absolutely cri critical and as vital as learning how to breathe. I just put it as an example. It's so crucial. Uh, it determines how we achieve. It determines how we are perceived by others. And it determines uh, an awful lot of, of how we spend our lives. Um, there's an individuality to our thinking, an individuality to our expression. Um, and talking is how we, we, we manifest that. Um, some people, particularly if they're going through a period of stress or trauma, uh, may not feel that they have anything to say or to contribute to conversation. Um, but that's not true. Um, and a way of learning what to say in a conversation, way of learning how to interact, is often realizing the thought pattern or the, the pattern of thoughts that are there and finding a way to express them. Um, we all have thoughts, but we don't always know how to express them in all the different situations. Um, I don't know if you saw the movie Up. Uh, Up is a, a cartoon movie in which there's something about, and some of the animals can talk. And I am always struck by the dog in Up because the dog is just the most wonderful creature, but is not very bright. Um, and so you, we revealed the thoughts of the dog, and you know, the, the ball is thrown, the dog goes, ball, 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 and you just hear the dog saying, ball, 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 ball. And so really for me that was revealing that uh, thought patterns um, are fundamental there, or that they are there, and um, sometimes all we have to do is realize they're there and express them. Now, hopefully we'd have something more interesting to say in our thought patterns and a little bit more illuminating than ball, 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 ball. Uh, but if someone uh, feels that they have communication issues and difficulties talking, the fundamental thing is to realize that we all have thought patterns, we all have views on things, and tuning into that and then finding ways to express them. Um, if you feel that talking is not your strong point and you wish to learn, practice. Okay? It can be practicing in front of a mirror. It can be uh, practicing in front of a group of people. Uh, it can be practicing, uh, practicing to, 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 to say something in, in, in different situations. It can be practicing reciting jokes. It can be practicing humorous anecdotes. Um, but practice can be a wonderful way to learn to communicate, to learn to talk. Um, So, relationships, the easy bit. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about relationships, 
but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend too long about it because it is it is such a difficult area. There's two headings I want to talk about in relationships, and it really has to do with personal relationships, not just what I was talking about a minute ago, communication and general relationships, but more personal relationships. And I talk about relationships and intent and relationships and power. Okay. So relationships and intent. Where you want to go with a friendship or an intimate relationship, by and large, is where you end up. Uh, and obviously it's not the only factor, uh, but often people, the outcome of relationship is determined by where the participants want to go in that relationship. Relationships, friendship or intimate relationships, are exponentially more difficult when someone th is going through a traumatic period. Okay? When someone is going through a period of anxiety, depression, of low self-esteem, of negative self-image, um, that can be exponentially worsened in a relationship. Why? Because uh, relationships often require a degree of tuning in to another person that is very difficult when someone is going through a really upsetting period. It is well known that if someone is in recovery from an addiction, um, uh, that it is not recommended that in an early period of recovery that starting a new relationship, a new intimate relationship, can be really quite destructive and often can, some people can, uh, because it's so emotionally fraught it is so, and it is so exposing of flaws or exposing of raw areas. So it's quite often recommended, it's not universal, but it's quite often recommended if you're in early recovery is that it's not the best time to start an intimate relationship because of the, uh, the exposure of uh, all raw areas. So Newton's law said that if there's to every reaction there is a a positive and equal reaction. Uh, in the, the, the law of relationships or the, is that to every reaction there is a negative and stronger reaction. So um, if you're going through a rough period, um, it is unfortunately a truism uh, that in a, in a close or emotional relationship that uh, that gets exposed and it can be, uh, it can be scratched and uh, instead of being met with sympathy and, uh, and, and support, it can be, it can be increased or, or uh, it can be uh, heightened. So uh, where that eventually ends up, by and large, relates to the personal healing and where someone wants to go with that relationship. Relationships and power I, I want to mention briefly because power is so fundamentally <coughs> important in a relationship. And understanding the importance of power in a relationship can save it from destruction. Uh, I talk about this particularly in terms of intimate relationships, but I also mean it in, even in, in social interaction, being aware that uh, power, which can be associated with uh, status, which can be associated with gender roles, and obviously, uh, attraction and, and uh, affection can overcome the power difficulties. Uh, so one, one side in a relationship can become very dependent, and another side can become uh, over-exercising of power. But by and large, the reason I, I want to mention it is that this is uh, such a fundamental truth about relationships that it's worth stating. And if, that, if you uh, have a, an intimate relationship and there's some difficulties in it, uh, appreciating the importance of power and status in that relationship can be an enormous way of understanding what is happening in a relationship. And balancing the power in a relationship or achieving that can be a wonderful way of, of seeing that through. The easy bit, the reason for it all, joy and purpose. Finding a real purpose in life is a journey, it is not a destination. Okay. Um, at various stages in life, we all have to cope with trauma, we all have to cope with distress, and working our way through a period of trauma and distress, learning from it, I was talking about it in terms of the negative emotions, so that you don't go through it again, is one wonderful way to, to increase the happiness in our lives. If we make a wrong decision, we explore it, 
we can learn from it so that we don't make it again. The power of positive thinking. It is extraordinary how a positive attitude can transform your life. Um, the, the, the mind is an extraordinary thing. Um, and if it's out of kilter, it can lead into cul-de-sacs and uh, periods of depression and underachievement. But if it's synergized, if it's working together, it can be a wonderful positive force that can really uh, uh, determine a very happy life. If you have your thinking, your feeling, and your acting working in the same direction, it's extraordinary. One analogy that makes sense to me is, is when I heard a description of a, um, a hypnotist uh, on a stage, and you watch a hypnotist on stage, and they get a bunch of people, and they you know, are asked to uh, become washing machines, and you look at uh, a bunch of half a dozen people imitating washing machines and uh, on stage, and you say, that's extraordinary. And then you look at it and they say, well, imagine everybody in the audience naked and then all the people start to get embarrassed and flushed. And, and I've, I've just seen that, and it's extraordinarily powerful. And that's the power of suggestion, because that's not you know, some miraculous, uh, amazing external force. That's an internal power. So the mind can influence what, what you think, what you do, but harnessing that can be... Uh, an extraordinarily positive thing. Um, allowing it to be a negative, allowing the different forces within a mind to, to work in different directions, um, uh, obviously can be very destructive. But when you get both thinking, acting, and feeling working in the same direction, it can truly lead to a very positive life experience. The ways of fulfillment, well, I, I came up with three. Um, uh, probably you will come up with your own list. I looked at uh, internal, so that the idea of a, a lot of people gain fulfillment and gain joy in life through exploring, understanding themselves, and gaining a peace with themselves. Um, so undergoing some of the journeys I've talked about, a wonderful way of achieving joy and fulfillment and ultimate happiness. A second way is through affection and love for another. Intimate relationships are probably the way that most of us try to achieve happiness and uh, achieve fulfillment. And uh, that's why I mention relationships, because they can be fundamentally wonderful, but they are, they are work. And then spiritual journey. I do not claim to be a, 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 as knowledgeable in spirituality as an enormous amount of people, but love of God and d d aiming for spiritual meaning in our lives can provide a, a sense of fulfillment and purpose which other areas cannot provide. So I'm going to end up with a quote from one of life's great philosophers, who's Paul Simon, um, who I think is just a wonderful songwriter. And he said, the feeling that life can be better is woven into our hearts and our brains. Okay? So we never get it quite right. We're always nearly there, never quite there. So there's always a certain amount of striving. So even when I talk about going through trauma, going through depression, going through anxiety, learning from it, making sure we don't go through the same thing again, aiming for joy and fulfillment, aiming in a positive way, harnessing all those forces in a positive way, we're never quite there. There's always a little 5%, a little bit more tame, and that's okay. Um, and if anybody has got that 100%, I'd love to hear them. Thank you very much. Thank you.